uh, for one of our Wednesday webinars. Thank you everybody for attending today. My name is Chris Bruni. I'm the VP of Sales at Security Health Plan, and these presentations are co-sponsored by Security Health Plan and the Marshfield Clinic Health System. They are meant to be informative and geared towards an employer audience, so uh, very pleased to have you again with us today. Uh, please note that this uh, meeting is being recorded, and the recording will be posted on our website um, shortly thereafter it ends, so probably by tomorrow or so. You can find uh, this episode and all previous episodes uh, on the Security Health Plan webpage under the COVID-19 um, folder. And then within that, there's an employer folder where all of them are listed out um, by the date that they were. And, and we're very pleased to have a returning guest today. So Dr. Ed Belanja uh, did present last summer as we were in the midst of the pandemic and, and uh, gave us an awful lot of information about, uh, about vaccines and, and what was actually coming uh, you know, to a theater near us very, very soon. And it actually ended up being uh, extremely uh, accurate and, and, and of course, uh, we all know as, as uh, the vaccine has rolled out, um, how effective uh, all the different versions have been so far. So uh, very pleased to, to have Ed here again. Uh, Ed is the, the director of the Center for uh, Clinical Epidemiology and Population Health at the Marshall Clinic Research Institute, as it states on the screen. Um, he's been very active in flu vaccine research over many, many years with the system and has been very active now in the COVID vaccine um, rollout and, and research as well. And, and the, the Research Foundation is also actively participating with the CDC um, in a number of different studies. And I don't know if Ed, you're going to touch on those. Uh, we won't spend time on that today, um, at least not in my introduction. I'll let you touch on that um, throughout your presentation. So if you do have a question today, please feel free to use the Q&A feature or the chat feature, and you can uh, ask your question. We will do our very best to get them all answered today uh, during the presentation. If there are too many or we have uh, some that we need to address later, we will get those out um, with the presentation. And Ashley, the, the hostess of our meeting, will be sending out the presentation again through email to all of you that did pre-register. So please uh, watch for that in your email, uh, typically within the next 24 uh, or so hours. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Blanchia. Uh, take it away. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'm delighted to be back after a year. Uh, a lot has changed in the interim and uh, try and address some of, uh, hopefully some of the key questions and, and leave plenty of time for a Q&A uh, at the end. Um, just to explain a little more about uh, my background, I've been doing vaccine research for two decades uh, here at the Marshall Clinic Research Institute. Most of it's funded by CDC. We've been doing a lot of flu vaccine research, but obviously we've we switched and we've been doing COVID vaccine um, for the past, um, I am, well, uh, preparing for the past year anyway, and, and doing it since the vaccines were uh, authorized. And we're also doing some um, studies on COVID epidemiology in rural populations. We have a household transmission study going on, and we have a, uh, a, a study of, of COVID in the community looking at um, the frequency of infection and risk factors. Um, so that's some of what, what's going on with COVID. Uh, I'm also on a CDC uh, working group um, that um, does background research for uh, a federal advisory panel that makes recommendations uh, for COVID vaccines and all other licensed vaccines. And so I get involved in the policy arena as well through that work. So uh, today, what I want to do <clears throat> is uh, go through some of the concerns that we've heard from our, our own employees and from others in terms of, of um, uh, concerns and, and questions that people have and trying to help you address some of those. Uh, first, let's just uh, briefly touch on vaccine hesitancy. Um, nationally, vaccine hesitancy is declining. And if you look uh, on the left-hand side of this, it uh, the bars uh, uh, show uh, different time periods from December 2020 at the bottom up through May of 2021 uh, from a national Kaiser survey. And you can see um, the proportion that um, are taking a wait and see attitude is declining and more and more people are saying that they've either gotten the vaccine or they're gonna get it as soon as possible. So that's good news, but there's around 20% um, or so that will basically um, uh, not get the vaccine or only if they're required to get the vaccine. And we haven't really made a huge dent in, in that. Uh, on the right hand side is the state of Wisconsin data. And um, hang on here. So, 
Uh, this was last updated um, about three weeks ago, but you can see that um, in central Wisconsin, that vaccine coverage um, with at least one dose is generally in the 40 to 50% range, but we have some counties in our service area where it's quite a bit lower. Uh, Clark County is, I, I believe, the lowest in the state with around 27%, and Taylor County is very low uh, as well. Uh, statewide now, uh, over 50% of people have received at least one dose. Uh, there are also important age differences that um, you don't see in the graph here. And uh, among adolescents 12 to 15 years old, only 28% have received a dose of vaccine. And for people 18 to 24, only 42% have received a dose of vaccine. In contrast, for people over 65, uh, 85% have uh, been vaccinated. So there's, uh, we have a long way to go yet for our adolescents and young adults. And that's gonna be really critical if we want to reach herd immunity and really slow down transmission in the state. Okay. Um, my slide's not advancing, let's see. Um, there we go. So I'd just like to uh, briefly, um, Summarize what we have learned about the mRNA vaccine effectiveness uh, since the, the vaccines were authorized several months ago. Uh, we know the vaccines generate a strong immune response to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And now we have multiple studies from around the world that confirm a high level effectiveness against COVID-19 infection and illness, including severe illness, we have evidence that they reduce the viral load and the duration of shedding in breakthrough infections. And that, what that means is that if you're one of the few people who does get infected, even though you've been vaccinated, you're less likely to transmit it to another person. And the vaccines are effective against the major variants. And we can talk about that um, later if you want. I'm not gonna go into that in detail, but the Delta variant from India is the one that people are most concerned about and is becoming the dominant variant in the United States at this time and currently accounts for around 20% of the infections in the United States. It is much more transmissible uh, than um, the previous uh, strain that was uh, widely circulating, which means that it's going to spread more rapidly uh, and more people will become infected from a, a, a single case. And so, this is a big threat to the unvaccinated population, but the vaccine does provide protection against the Delta variant, including protection, high level of protection against hospitalization and severe illness with the Delta variant. Uh, and then the bottom uh, of this uh, figure just kind of shows one of many studies. This one looked at the Pfizer vaccine in particular. Uh, it's in British healthcare workers, and they found uh, basically 85% vaccine effectiveness against uh, both symptomatic and asymptomatic infection. Okay, so I just wanna sort of go through some common reasons for vaccine hesitancy that we have heard uh, from our own employees and from others, and try and provide some uh, factual information that you can use um, uh, to uh, provide useful information to help people make an informed choice. <clears throat> So um, reason number one is the COVID-19 vaccines were rushed without enough testing. I would rather wait until they are licensed. <clears throat> and there are um, four things that I think are important to keep in mind and to um, point out to people who have that concern. One is that these vaccines didn't come out of nowhere with the pandemic. There actually was a whole body of research on the immune response based on the original SARS, which occurred in 2003 and was wiped out with a very aggressive public health response. But following that in 2003, a lot of work was done in terms of understanding how the SARS virus uh, works, um, how, what type of immune response it generates and what you need to do to make an effective vaccine. And there, in fact, there were a number of vaccines in development um, the same thing is true for the mRNA vaccines. There's been two decades of work on mRNA vaccines uh, going on before um, COVID-19 came around. And so they built on both of those. The other thing is they overlap the clinical trial phases. Normally, a, um, a company that's developing a vaccine would go through the sequence of, of studies, starting with phase one, which is sort of the earliest, smallest studies in humans for safety, onto phase two, and then finally to phase three, which are much larger studies with tens of thousands of people 
um, in order to show that the vaccine is effective and safe in, ver in large populations. And that process often takes a decade for a regular vaccine. Uh, in the case of the COVID-19 vaccines, they, uh, they compress that down to a short time period by taking the different phases and putting them into a single protocol where it would automatically roll over to advance the vaccine to the next phase without um, pausing. Uh, and to make that possible, um, to get that all done in a short time, the U.S. government basically supported manufacturing scale up even before they knew that if the vaccines would work or not. So the U.S. government was basically taking the financial risk of manufacturing vaccines that may or may not work. Uh, and they were still waiting for the results of the clinical trials. Um, and obviously, if the vaccine did not work and was never authorized, all of that manufacturing would go to waste. But in fact, um, it, it did work. The vaccines were highly effective, uh, both Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, um, and then later Janssen. And so the manufacturing scale up allowed them to start shipping the vaccines just as soon as the vaccines were authorized by the FDA. And then lastly, the FDA um, uh, provided guidance to the industry even before the vaccines were authorized to make very clear what their standards were in terms of safety and efficacy. <clears throat> um, okay, number two, uh, these vaccines are only for emergency use. Uh, I don't think it's an emergency and I would rather wait until they are licensed. Well, uh, this gets into a little bit of semantics. Um, emergency use authorization is sort of a regulatory pathway that allows the FDA to shorten sort of the, the lengthy um, um, sort of bureaucratic regulatory process in order to get something out quickly if there's an emergency situation where the benefits outweigh the risks. Uh, however, um, much of the emergency authorization process is very much the same as licensing. The FDA scientists review the application, they, they independently reanalyze all of the data from the trial provided by the manufacturer. The FDA requires safety follow-up for at least two months, and that is a difference compared to licensure where they would typically require safety follow-up for at least six months. They also require vaccine efficacy greater than 50%. Um, and um, the vaccine, current vaccines uh, uh, blow that away in terms of much higher effectiveness than 50%. And the FDA also um, sought independent review from an expert advisory panel. These are not government employees. These are independent experts who are vetted for conflict of interest. Uh, FDA has a panel um, and uh, Center for, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has another panel called ACIP. And um, they independently reviewed the evidence and made a determination and a recommendation as to whether the vaccines should be authorized and used in, in uh, U.S. populations. For licensure, they will have longer safety data. Um, there's some additional uh, requirements for licensure that include manufacturing practices and facilities. And there's a whole component of this related to good manufacturing practices. Um, with a FDA review of every step in the manufacturing process, and these are complex manufacturing procedures. Um, they will reanalyze the trial data, um, and, and again, as, as with emergency use authorization, it'll be independently reviewed by those two panels. So uh, the good news is that both Pfizer and Moderna have already um, uh, applied for full FDA uh, licensure for their vaccines, and so the FDA has that data, um, in a typical circumstance, they would take a year to review it. I don't expect it's gonna take that long. I think they understand the urgency of the situation, but uh, they have not given any timeline as far as when we can expect a decision from them. Okay, vaccine hesitancy reason number three, uh, natural immunity is better than vaccination. Um, I'm protected because I already had COVID. And um, there is some truth to that, that is people who had COVID um, do in fact um, have some level of protection lasting for uh, at least several months after. Uh, however, th the level of protection is quite variable um, and people who had milder case of COVID tend to have a reduced antibody response to, to the infection. And so the duration and strength of their protection is unclear and it and it's, uh, appears to be more variable in, in people who are naturally um, infected. Um, if you vaccinate someone who previously had COVID, uh, they develop a very strong boost in their antibody response after the first dose of vaccine. So it's like 
the first dose of vaccine for those people is like the second dose for everybody else. It's boosting the response to the prior exposure. And so you get very high antibody levels uh, that are substantially greater than what they got after their original infection. And so that suggests that they do in fact have higher protection um, that is likely to be longer lasting than the natural uh, infection. The other thing that's been shown um, is from multiple studies is that the protection against variant viruses um, is better that it, from a vaccination. That is the vaccination um, response is going to give you more broader protection against these variant strains like um, the, the gamma strain and the delta strain um, compared to um, a natural infection with um, the original strain of, of um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so, um, and, and then obviously, you know, the other big downside to natural immunity is if you get naturally infected, you run the risk of dying or being put in the ICU or uh, developing long COVID with chronic symptoms and um, neurological symptoms, um, um, heart problems, chronic lung problems, uh, um, brain fog, um, loss of taste or smell that can go on for months. And so um, this is a real downside to natural infection, that whereas the vaccine is, it provides protection without all of those um, harmful uh, health effects. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Number four, the vaccine contains, and then fill in the blank, uh, fetal tissue, SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, metal, microchips, um, uh, et cetera. Um, the image on the right is um, a graphic uh, from um, uh, an Instagram account called um, uh, Un Unbiased Science Podcast. They obviously have a podcast. It's run by uh, an immunologist and a public health scientist. Um, and I've looked at a lot of the materials, um, I have no connection to them, but they, they seem to be very good about providing um, uh, factual scientific information and they, they have great graphics. Uh, and so this graphic just shows what's actually in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines um, and in the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and all the things that are not in those vaccines. And uh, if folks have specific questions about any of those things, we might be happy to come back to that. Okay, I'm gonna spend most of the rest of my time on um, reason number five, which is safety. And that is, I'm worried about safety and long-term side effects. So let's just talk a little bit about safety monitoring and, and what we know about safety. One, of course, the original authorization is based on safety data from the clinical trials where they have, uh, in the case of, of, of the mRNA vaccines, around 15 or 20,000 people got the vaccine in the clinical trials and they looked at safety uh, in those people. But then once they authorize it, we're giving it to millions of people and we have um, uh, national systems to monitor safety. One of the main systems is called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System or VAERS. Uh, this is a system where anybody uh, from a patient or a doctor or, or anyone else can report into the system online if they think something happened after a vaccine that might have been related. So it's, uh, it's a very large system. It covers the whole country. And as a result, it's, it's helpful for detecting possible um, signals or clusters of, of rare adverse events that need further investigation. But it has some major limitations. That is, um, we don't know who's reporting um, and we don't, um, it's reporting can be biased toward people who are looking for particular outcomes. We don't have a denominator usually, we can't really calculate rates very well. And very importantly, this system is not designed to determine whether a vaccine is causing a particular outcome. For example, you give the vaccine to a, a million people who live in a nursing home, some of those people are gonna die within a few days after getting the vaccine, completely by chance, had nothing to do with the vaccine. But you can get various reports of those things, of people dying, just because if something happens after a vaccine, people are encouraged to report it to VAERS. But it does not mean that the event reported in VAERS was actually caused by the vaccine. And that's something that the, there's a lot of misinformation on uh, on the internet. Um, and, and people are sort of, I think, deliberately um, um, promoting um, misinformation um, uh, based on that. So uh, VAERS is helpful, but it's in and of itself, it does not answer the question as to whether a particular problem is caused by a vaccine. For that, um, we look at other sources and the FDA has some uh, large claims databases where they're doing near real-time surveillance 
uh, including their CMS, which is the Medicare database, which has over 100 million people covered. In addition, um, there's a, a network of sites um, involved in the vaccine safety data link, and the Marshfield Clinic is part of that system where we link uh, electronic health records and immunization records in order to look for rare and serious uh, vaccine safety um, um, uh, concerns in large populations. And the VST currently has data on over 12 million people per year, uh, and there are nine participating organizations as shown in this map of the US. Um, <clears throat> the vaccine safety data link is doing uh, weekly analyses. It's, uh, we call it rapid cycle analysis. And essentially, uh, we're comparing the number of observed cases of a particular problem, such as a heart attack or a stroke or myocarditis um, in a risk window after vaccination uh, to some comparison level that we would expect as the background rate. And then we, by looking at the observed and expected, we can apply some statistical tests to determine whether or not we have a signal for an elevated number of cases over and above what we would expect by chance in that risk window. And if that's the case, then that triggers even further investigations to try and investigate what's going on. On the right-hand side of this uh, slide, you can see the pre-specified um, health problems that we track every week to see if there's any evidence for uh, a signal. And we, we currently have data on over 10 million uh, first doses of mRNA vaccines uh, in VSD. So this is giving us a lot of ability to find associations with rare problems. I want to specifically address myocarditis because that's been in the news uh, and that was identified as a potential problem based on reports to VAERS, as I mentioned earlier, but doesn't prove anything just by virtue of VAERS. However, when, when the vaccine safety data link looked at this, we did in fact confirm that there is an elevated risk of myocarditis, which is heart inflammation, in adolescents and young adults after uh, receiving an mRNA vaccine. Uh, the, the risk is primarily in adolescents and young adults, uh, primarily in males, and primarily after the second dose of vaccine. Uh, the typical onset is chest pain within a few days after being vaccinated. Uh, the preliminary data is that most cases are mild and recover um, uh, quickly, uh, but we're, they're being follow up to, to uh, find out if there are any longer term consequences. Um, although the, the rate is higher than expected by chance, the absolute risk of developing myocarditis in, in people aged 12 to 39 is only about 13 cases per million uh, second doses of vaccine. And so uh, it's a very rare outcome, um, but it is being monitored. And um, uh, the um, CDC advisory panel that I mentioned uh, has uh, uh, reviewed the benefits and risks of myocarditis. Um, and uh, concluded that um, vaccination is preventing far more hospitalizations and deaths and serious illness um, than the number of myocarditis cases, the small number of myocarditis cases that, that might be expected. And so they concluded that the benefits outweigh the risks, but, but people need to be informed of this so that people can make an informed choice. And uh, the FDA has included a, a warning um, in the fact sheet for people who are being vaccinated so that people understand that this risk of myocarditis um, has been found. Um, and this is, uh, this is, show, is from um, um, the ACIP meeting um, a week ago where they were going through the risk benefit analysis. And it just shows this for adolescents, males and females. Um, if you um, give a million second doses of vaccine, it, the estimate is, um, you know, 5,000 to 8,000 cases prevented, 183 to 215 hospitalizations prevented, um, 38 to 71 ICU admissions prevented. Uh, and the cost of that, the risk of that is that these vaccines might trigger 8 to 10 myocarditis cases in females and 56 to 69 myocarditis cases in males. And that was the basis for concluding that the the risks, um, I mean, the benefits exceed the risks. And in fact, if you look at older age groups above age 17, um, the, the balance favors benefits even more than it does in this age group. <clears throat> so in, in summary, there are no serious safety issues in clinical trials. Um, with over 300 million doses uh, distributed nationally um, and multiple safety systems monitoring it, we, we uh, have a high level of confidence that the vaccines are safe in general. 
Uh, the two issues we've noted are with the Janssen vaccine, there's, there's a risk of rare blood clots and low platelets, especially in women under 50. Um, and there's evidence of um, rare myocarditis cases after the second dose of mRNA vaccines, um, especially in uh, male adolescents and young adults. And safety monitoring is continuing uh, to identify anything else that might come up. So I just want to conclude with uh, what we can, um, what advice we can give people to help them make an informed choice. One is be skeptical. The internet is full of garbage and anyone can publish anything on the internet. Um, anecdotes and videos are not scientific evidence. Uh, correlation is not causation and people um, misinterpret VAERS and there, there are YouTube videos uh, claiming that the, the government is covering up all this evidence in plain sight and they go to VAERS and they say, look, if people have reported deaths after VAERS, doesn't mean anything. Uh, distinguish real experts from fake experts. There are lots of fake experts on the on the internet, and um, um, it's it's important to understand the difference. Avoid confirmation bias, and what that means is essentially is we're all sort of hardwired to want to believe things that are consistent with our beliefs. And so, if you are in a certain you know go to certain media sites on the internet to get your information, and those are promoting conspiracy theories. Uh, about COVID vaccines, um, um, you're going to be more likely to reject uh, valid scientific evidence that conflicts with those conspiracy theories. And so we all have to sort of try and focus on the evidence and avoid confirmation bias. Uh, trust the consensus from high quality peer reviewed studies. Any single study might get it wrong, but if you have multiple studies all reaching the same conclusion, that provides some stronger evidence that, that the science is going in the right direction. And lastly, talk to your primary care provider. Your primary care provider may or may not be a, 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 an expert on COVID-19 vaccines, but um, can provide uh, important information to put your own risk in context and can certainly get answers if you have particular questions. And so I think that's, that's an important part of, of this message for um, employees and the general public. Uh, so, uh, thank you for your time. And at this point, I will stop and be happy to take any questions with the time we have left. And I'm, I can stay on a little longer if folks can uh, stay beyond 1230. All right, sounds good. Um, really good presentation, Dr. Blanja. And I, I failed to say this at the beginning, but when you came on last summer, that still today is, is uh, one of my um, favorite, if not my favorite presentation you ever gave. And that was leading into to what the vaccines will be able to do. And, and, and it was so spot on. Um, so I just really appreciate you coming back on and and reprising that that presentation today. Um, one thing that uh, that I think you you mentioned, I just wanted to clarify again. Typically, when we see, uh, and again, we've got I don't know how many years of of giving vaccines, 50, 60 years, 70 years of of providing vaccines in general in, in this country and around the world. Um, typically, when there's going to be um, a side effect that's attributed to the vaccine, how quickly do we see that after it's been delivered? In, in almost every case where vaccines, uh, serious vaccine related problems have been identified, those problems have occurred within eight weeks after the person got the vaccine. Um, things don't happen a year or two later. And so if we have uh, the FDA required uh, at least eight weeks of follow up for uh, half the participants, um, once we get the licensure on these uh, mRNA vaccines, that will be bumped up to at least six months of follow up. I, I'd be, I would be shocked if anything is found with six months of follow-up that wasn't already apparent um, at, by eight weeks, uh, but it's good that longer is better. Uh, so the, the chance of something long-term showing up based on a long history of vaccine development um, with literally hundreds of vaccines is that, you know, if you're gonna find a problem, you're gonna find it in the first eight weeks or so. Great. Um... And as far as those long-term effects, you, you kind of went over that, but what could they be? This is another question that came from our audience. Um, well, I mean, uh, you know, long-term effects such as, I mean, uh, the only example of, of something developing long after vaccination that I'm aware of is a narcolepsy, which is a sleep disorder that was linked in some studies 
to a vaccine that was used in Europe and not in the United States during the 2009 pandemic. Um, there's some question as to whether that association is real or not. Um, but some of those cases of narcolepsy, because of the, the long time it takes for someone to sort of get a diagnosis of narcolepsy, um, occurred beyond eight weeks. Um, but other than that, um, for, there have been prior episodes of vaccines like the 1976 um, uh, swine flu vaccine, this is going way back, was linked to um, a neurological problem called Guillain-Barre syndrome. But again, those all showed up within a few weeks after vaccination. And if you could you go back to slide, I think it was 16 or 17. I think it was 17. Sure. Uh, okay, well, seven, this one? This, this is this one, the 16, I'm sorry, 16. Yeah. 16, okay. So 16 was where you had highlighted the myocarditis uh, and that the low uh, adjusted rate ratio of 0.94. Um, there are other ones that are on here that are that are higher that um, are not making, uh, making the press necessarily. Um, any of these that people should be, would these be considered um, long-term effects? Okay, so uh, let me just explain this this uh, table. These are <clears throat> there's no evidence for any of these particular things occurring after um, COVID nineteen vaccination. Uh, these are basically pre specified outcomes that uh, are based on things that uh, are either related might possibly related to COVID itself. Anything that COVID itself could cause is something that we would be interested in looking at as a possible effect after vaccination, um, even if there's no evidence at all. Uh, so for example, uh, COVID itself can cause a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. And so myocardial infarction is, is on there. Same thing with stroke and, so, uh, and with blood clots. And so we have a number of things on this list that we're just monitoring to see if there's any evidence um, for an increased risk. And in the middle column where, where it says rate ratio, a ratio of one means that there's no increased risk at all. It's exactly the same. Um, and um, I would just point out, I didn't really explain this, myocarditis actually in this table does not show an increased risk. On the next slide, it does. And that's because in this, um, in the main analysis, we're including all age groups. And if you look at myocarditis across all ages, you don't see any, any um, signal of risk. If you restrict your myocarditis to looking at adolescents and young adults, then you do see a signal. So that, that's just a little twist there. And that's what the VAERS reports um, uh, uh, really uh, stimulated us to look at myocarditis more carefully. Um, but, you know, so we're looking at all these different adverse events um, in, in VSD to, uh, as just a, a monitoring system, not, but we don't have any evidence that any of them are actually causing any problem. Great. All right. Well, thank you for going back and explaining this one, because I clearly had gotten that wrong uh, in going over it the first time. So yep. um, I'm guessing I, I'm not alone there, but maybe I was. Uh, I don't have any other questions from our audience. Um, Dr. Belanger, thank you very much for coming on today and going through this. Again, this will be sent out to everybody that did pre-register and, um, and it has been recorded, so it will be on our website. And once again, thanks. Thanks for being here and thanks to everybody for attending. Have a great day, everybody, and be well. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye now. Bye-bye.